So how people think about air is largely defined in how they experience it. So for example, we are very good at feeling temperature and humidity. And so because of this, we have spent millennia trying to develop ways and strategies to control both temperature and humidity. And now over the past 50 years, a lot of effort's been spent trying to study how both temperature and humidity affect the transmission of airborne viruses, so things like SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. And one of the main reasons we're doing this is that if temperature or humidity has a dramatic effect on transmission, we can use our ability to control these parameters to help mitigate transmission. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, numerous studies have been published to show how humidity can affect airborne transmission. Uh, for example, these studies show that the transmission correlates with humidity. So this means that we can limit transmission if we simply lower humidity. This is great. Except that these studies clearly show that transmission goes up when humidity is lowered. In that case, we can limit transmission by raising the humidity. In other words, the exact opposite. And then there's this study that disagrees with both of these and shows that the transmission is the lowest when the humidity is between 40 and 60%, also known as the famed sweet spot. So what's going on here? These studies directly contradict each other. How? Why? Obviously, this has led to some confusion. And so over this video and the next, I'm going to walk through the relation between humidity and viral, airborne viral transmission in a couple of different ways. So in this video, I'm going to look at the whole, essentially the net effect humidity has been reported to have on airborne transmission. In the next video, I'm going to break down the different factors that affect airborne viral transmission and walk through it mechanistically to really explore the effect that humidity has on each of the various components of transmission. And from that, try to get an idea of what you would expect the relationship between humidity and transmission to be. Understood. In order to understand how humidity affects airborne viral transmission, we need to first define what we're talking about. So for airborne transmission to occur, an infected person must first exhale virus containing the aerosol that is then transported through the air and inhaled by a non-infected person. A straightforward three-step process. Exhalation, transport, exposure. Simple. Well, not really. <laughs> really not at all. Um, like, for example, there's the issue of distance. So exhaled aerosol is initially in a plume. And understanding the nature of this plume, things like its size, and how it evolves as a function of environmental conditions, is its own entire area of research. Now, if the healthy individual is in the plume, the likelihood of transmission is at its highest, as exposure is also at its highest, since physically, the number of particles have yet to be diluted. Also, biologically, not enough time has passed for the virus to decay. Thus, the number of infected infectious particles is at its highest in the plume. Thus, the likelihood of transmission will be higher in shorter distances. Now, transmission beyond the plume can also occur. While long-distance transmission is possible, it is far less likely. This is due to the aerosol plume breaking down, which significantly lowers the number of concentration of infected viruses within a given space. And much like understanding what happens in an exhaled plume, the trajectory of exhaled aerosol throughout a room and how they are removed with things like opening a window are another entire area of research. Second, time passes, which provides time for the virus to decay naturally in the aerosol. When combined, the net result is a significant lowering of transmission risk. Likewise, the rate in which the virus decays in aerosol is its own area of research. Notably, this is one where I've published a fair bit. So, to truly understand viral transmission, one needs to understand these processes. They also need to understand these processes and these processes. And this is really just a brief summary of factors that I've thought of, and I'm sure there's more. And here's the thing, all of them matter, all of them. So just some information about myself. Um, I have published articles in these areas, so I'm confident in discussing them. I have not published in these others, so my expertise in them range from moderate to poor. All right, so clearly airborne viral transmission is a complex process involving many different parameters. 
The question is, how does humidity affect transmission? At a glance, there are parts of this process that are clearly affected by humidity, such as particle dynamics and airborne viral decay, so they ought to have an effect. Others, however, are independent of humidity, so they wouldn't be expected to have an effect. Now, given the complexities involved, and the fact that humidity affects multiple parameters, the question then becomes, would you actually expect humidity to have a clear-cut effect on transmission, like one way or the other? Um, so to determine this, there are two main ways in which people study the effect on, of humidity on transmission. Uh, these are animal studies and epidemiological studies. In animal studies, researchers will place test animals into a couple of cages. Uh, for SARS-CoV-2, hamsters and ferrets have been used. The cages will be separated by a tube where environmental factors like temperature and humidity are controlled. They will then infect the test animal and see how altering these factors affects the transmission rates. What has been reported is that humidity had either minimal or no effect on transmission. Now this is important because in animal studies, almost all of the factors that affect transmission are controlled or at least as best as can, you can do, really. Now, to see how an airborne virus is transmitted through a human population, um, <laughs> for obvious ethical reasons, scientists can't simply repeat this experiment with human subjects. So consequently, how environmental factors such as humidity affect transmission needs to be inferred through epidemiology. Now, I referred to the outcomes of some of these studies at the start of the video. In short, collectively, they are inconclusive. Now, why is that? I think it's important to understand what these studies are actually measuring and what they're doing. So for example, in this study, they correlate outdoor humidity with transmission risk. COVID is almost spread entirely indoors, meaning this observation may simply be correlation and not causation. Now, in this study, they try to account for this by estimating the average indoor relative humidity across the globe by using the outdoor humidity. Um, personally, I feel this is an extraordinarily ambitious assumption to make, um, as it doesn't account for the myriad of ways people proactively change their indoor uh, air quality with th things like you know air conditioners, heaters, that kind of thing. And so I guess the amount of confidence you have in this study will largely depend on how valid you feel their assumption of, or their estimation of what indoor air is. So I guess the question then becomes really like, why do people think humidity has a significant effect on the spread of, air, of COVID-19 at all? Well, this is largely due to the underlying assumptions that were made at the start of the pandemic. Now, once it was realized that COVID is airborne, it was expected to have many similar characteristics as other well-studied airborne viruses, such as influenza. So to be clear, in the early stages of a pandemic, this is a reasonable assumption to make. Unfortunately, many of these assumptions have since found to be simply not true. Like, uh, for example, um, COVID-19 is not seasonal. Uh, flu comes and goes like clockwork, uh, but COVID just keeps coming wave after wave after wave. Uh, another incorrect assumption is the relationship between humidity and transmission. Uh, it's been widely reported that influenza spreads less when the humidity is between 40 and 60 percent. Uh, COVID, as discussed here, the effect of humidity is insignificant. And so much like how it took years for the WHO to say that COVID is airborne, these initial assumptions have a way of putting up barriers in understanding. These claims take little to no evidence to make and for them to spread. And then when they're left unchallenged, these assumptions can easily become dogma especially for something that is abstract as airborne viral transmission. And paradoxically, it takes an extraordinary amount of evidence to change opinions once these beliefs take hold. Okay. So in short, there is no evidence that humidity affects the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the epidemiological studies have been largely inconsistent and the animal studies show minimal, if any, effect at all. Um, so the question then becomes, why? And so the next video, I'm going to dive into this and really show and walk through the various aspects of airborne transmission 
and how humidity affects each one of these. So essentially walking through mechanistically the, the process. Um, so with that, um, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below or just ask me on Blue Sky or Twitter. And for those interested, um, Nick's my cat has all of the uh, references that were used to uh, make this video. So talk to you again soon.